talent is never enough. Discover the choices that will take you beyond your talent. Written and copyrighted by John C. Maxwell in 2007. This abridged audiobook was published by Thomas Nelson Publishers, Nashville, Tennessee. Talent is often overrated and frequently misunderstood. When people achieve great things, others often explain their accomplishments by simply attributing everything to talent. But that is a false and misleading way of looking at success. If talent alone is enough, then why do you and I know highly talented people who are not highly successful? This is not an anti-talent book. I believe in the importance of talent. How could I not? All successful leaders understand its importance. Legendary college football coach Lou Holtz once told me, John, I've coached teams with good players and I've coached teams with bad players. I'm a better coach when I have good players. The more talent that a sports, business, or service team possesses, the greater potential it has and the better its leaders can be. I don't mean to minimize the importance of talent. Talent is a God-given gift that should be celebrated. When we observe talented people, we should marvel at their giftedness. Reading leadership books by Jack Welch, I am amazed by his deep wisdom mixed with common sense. It is no surprise that he was able to turn around GE and lift it to a dominant position in corporate America. He is a born leader. Every time I have the opportunity, I go to Sarah Brightman's concerts. I find that her voice sets her apart from other vocal artists. I often close my eyes and just listen to her sing, marveling at the giftedness of this diva. Sarah Brightman is a born vocalist. Professional football in Atlanta rose to a new level when Michael Vick came to town. His ability to run a football is guaranteed to thrill the crowd every game. He has lifted his team and the Falcons fans with his extraordinary gifts. Michael Vick is a born athlete. Talent can enable people to do extraordinary things, and we should acknowledge people's talents and marvel at their accomplishments. As we observe talented people, we should separate what they can do from who they are. Fred Smith, author and former president of Fred Smith Associates, shared a bit of wisdom with me many years ago. He said, John, the giftedness is usually greater than the person. By that he meant that the talent of some people is greater than the other important personal attributes, such as character and commitment. As a result, they often fail to rise to the level of their talent. Talented people are always tempted to coast on their abilities, or they want others to recognize their skills but overlook their deficiencies. Haven't you known people who should have risen to the top but didn't? They had all the talent they should ever need, but they still didn't succeed. So is talent ever enough? Yes, but only in the very beginning. Talent stands out. It gets you noticed. In the beginning, talent separates you from the rest of the pack. It gives you a head start on others. For that reason, natural talent is one of life's greatest gifts. But the advantage it gives lasts only a short time. Talent is only a starting point in business. You've got to keep working that talent. Too many talented people who start with an advantage over others lose that advantage because they rest on their talent instead of raising it. They assume that talent alone will keep them out front. They don't realize the truth. If they merely wing it, others will soon fly past them. Talent is more common than they think. Mega best-selling author Stephen Keen asserts that talent is cheaper than table salt. What separates the talented individual from the successful one is a lot of hard work. Clearly, more than just talent is needed for anyone who wants to achieve success. So what does it take to succeed? Where does that leave you and me? Can anyone be successful? And where does talent fit in? Here's what I believe. One, everyone has talent. People have equal value, but not equal giftedness. Some people seem to be blessed with a multitude of talents. Most of us have fewer abilities. But know this, all of us have something that we can do well. In their book, Now Discover Your Strengths, Marcus Buckingham and Donald O. Clifton 
state that every person is capable of doing something better than the next 10,000 people, and they support that assertion with solid research. They call this area the strength zone, and they encourage everyone to find it and make the most of it. It doesn't matter how aware you are of your abilities, how you feel about yourself, or whether you previously have achieved success. You have talent, and you can develop that talent. Number two, develop the talent you have, not the one you want. If I ask you who would be more successful, the person who relies on his talent alone or the person who realizes his talent and develops it, the answer would be obvious. Then I'll ask you this question. Why do most people spend the majority of their time focused on strengthening their weaknesses? One thing I teach people at my conferences is to stop working on their weaknesses and start working on their strengths. By this, I mean abilities, not attitude or character issues, which must be addressed. The question remains, what creates the effectiveness that Peter Drucker says is necessary for converting talent into results? It comes from the choices you make. The key choices you make, apart from the natural talent you already have, will set you apart from others who have talent alone. I've discovered 13 key choices that can be made to maximize any person's talent. Number one, belief lifts your talent. Number two, passion energizes your talent. Number three, Initiative activates your talent. Four, focus directs your talent. Number five, preparation positions your talent. Six, practice sharpens your talent. Number seven, perseverance sustains your talent. Number eight, courage tests your talent. Number nine, teachability expands your talent. Number 10, character protects your talent. 11, relationships influence your talent. Number 12, responsibility strengthens your talent. And number 13, teamwork multiplies your talent. Make these choices and you can become a talent plus person. If you have talent, you stand alone. If you have talent plus, you stand out. I believe the ideas in this audiobook can help you. Talent is Never Enough was inspired by something that happened to me in 2004. Coach Jim Tressel asked me to speak to the Ohio State football team on the weekend that they played Michigan. It was more than just a speaking engagement for me. It was a dream come true. I grew up in Ohio, and I have been a lifelong Buckeye fan. Coach Tressel had read my book, Today Matters because his players were very young and he wanted to teach them to keep their focus on the 2004 football season, the team studied the book throughout the year. Coach Tressel wanted me to speak to the team on the last and most important game of the regular season schedule. It was an unforgettable experience. I spoke to the Buckeyes on Friday night, walked with them to the stadium on Saturday, and went into their locker room where I saw a countdown clock for the Michigan game that also said, today matters. Could it get any better? Yes. Coach Tressel turned to me while we were still in the locker room and said, John, you and I will lead the team out on the football field. In front of a hundred thousand screaming fans, we ran onto the field and I'll never forget that moment. Could it get any better? Yes. I was on the sidelines with the team for the entire game and it got even better than that. Ohio State won. Now, how does this relate to talent is never enough? Prior to my visit, Coach Tressel had sent me some information on Ohio State football to help me prepare. One item was the winner's manual that contained an article titled, Things That Do Not Require Talent. It emphasized that characteristics such as punctuality, effort, patience, and unselfishness were important to the OSU football program. Not one of those things required any talent. Coach Tressel told me that he and his staff were trying to help their talented players realize that their talent alone was not enough. I loved the article and thought that if I wrote a book on the subject, it could help a lot of people. You see, people who neglect to make the right choices to release and maximize their talent continually underperform. 
Their talent allows them to stand out, but their wrong choices make them sit down. Their friends, families, coaches, and bosses see their giftedness, but they wonder why so often they come up short of expectations. Their talent gives them opportunity, but their wrong choices shut the door. Talent is a given, but you must earn success. In contrast, talent plus people come as close as humanly possible to achieving their potential. They frequently overperform. People see their giftedness and are amazed at how they continually rise above expectations. Their talent gives them opportunity, and their right choices open the door for even greater success. Life is a matter of choices, and every choice you make makes you. One of the most important choices you will make is who you will become. Life is not merely a matter of holding and playing a good hand as you would hope to do in a card game. What you start with isn't up to you. Talent is God-given. Life is playing the hand you have been dealt with. That is determined by your choices. Talent plus right choices equal a talent plus person. The talent plus people are the ones who maximize their talent, reach their potential, and fulfill their destiny. I was reading a book by Dr. Zeus to my grandchildren called, Oh, the Places You'll Go. In it, I found a wonderful truth. It said, You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. I believe that with all my heart. My prayer is that talent is never enough, will help you to steer yourself in the right direction and make right choices that will empower you to become a talent plus person build upon the foundation of your abilities, and live your life to the fullest potential. Chapter 1. Belief Lifts Your Talent The first and greatest obstacle to success for most people is their belief in themselves. Once people figure out where their sweet spot is, the area where they are most gifted, what often hinders them isn't lack of talent. It's lack of trust in themselves, which is a self-imposed limitation. Lack of belief can act as a ceiling on talent. However, when people believe in themselves, they unleash power in themselves and resources around them that almost immediately take them to a higher level. Your potential is a picture of what you can become. Belief helps you see the picture and reach for it. It has become an American sports legend. People call it the guarantee. At the time, it seemed like little more than an outrageous statement. Bravado from a high-profile athlete whose team was the underdog before the big game. It occurred on January 9, 1969, just three days before the third World Championship game of football, the first that was called the Super Bowl. It was just eight simple words uttered by the Jets quarterback, Joe Namath. The Jets will win Sunday. I guarantee it. That boastful statement may not seem remarkable today, Ever since the career of Muhammad Ali, bold statements by athletes have been commonplace. But people didn't hear those kinds of boasts from anyone playing in the upstart American Football League. The eight-year-old AFL was considered to be inferior, and in the previous two World Championship football games, the AFL teams had been trounced. Most experts believed it would be many years before an AFL team could compete at the level of any NFL team. The NFL Colts were favored to win this third championship game by 18 or 19 points. Namus' guarantee might have seemed outrageous, but it was more than a hollow boast. It wasn't out of character for him either. Despite the fact that Namus was often quick to take the blame in interviews when the Jets lost, he always displayed a powerful self-confidence. He believed in himself, his team, and their ability to win the game. That ability to believe in himself was something that could be traced all the way back to his childhood. Joe Namath always possessed athletic talent. He came from a family of athletes. His first coaches were his family members. John, his father, spent a lot of time showing him how to throw, hit, and field a baseball and teaching him what to do in various game situations. His brothers contributed, too. His brother Bobby started teaching him the position of quarterback when Joe was only six and Brother Frank drilled him and pounded him if he didn't perform well in their family practices. Growing up, Joe was small and light for his age. Sometimes people underestimated him because of that. 
When he was in elementary school, a group of kids from an even tougher neighborhood than his own challenged his friend Linwood Alford to a game of two-on-two basketball. Linwood and Joe showed up to play, and Linwood recalled, they were all laughing like, who's this little scrawny kid? How are you going to win with this guy? Joe might have looked like an easy kid to beat, but he wasn't. You knocked him down, he got right back up, observed Alford. Joe wasn't no pretty boy. Joe and Linwood beat the other kids and quickly earned their respect. The key to unleashing the belief that lifted his talent occurred when Joe Namath was eight years old. He came home with his first team uniform for the Elks Little League baseball team. Namath's biography recounts the exchange that occurred between young Joe and his father John. That's real nice, son. Fits you good. Joey was the smallest kid on that team. He was the youngest, too, probably by a year. You know, Daddy, those other kids are so good, he said. They're bigger than I am, and I don't have a chance. Well, you take that uniform off right now, his father said. Take it back to the manager and tell him that you can't make the team because the other boys are better than you are. Joey looked at his father with those sad, dreamy eyes. Oh, no, Daddy, I can't do that. If you can't make the team... What's the use of keeping the uniform? But, Daddy, he said, they're so good. You're good, too. You can feel grounders. You can hit the ball. You know where to make the plays. John gave the boy a choice. Return the uniform or practice with the team. If after the practice he didn't feel that he was better than every other kid, he should quit. Joey said he'd try. As it happened, he turned out to be the best player on that Elks team. The belief that John Namath tried to instill in his son was not misplaced. As a high school basketball player, he was fast, he could shoot, and unlike most of his opponents and teammates, he could dunk. As a football player, he led his Beaver Falls team to win the Western Pennsylvania Interscholastic Athletic League Championship. Before one of the games, when Joe had a sore ankle, the confident quarterback who also punted for the team assured his worried coach, Don't worry, coach, we won't have to punt. Namath was heavily recruited out of high school, and some referred to him as the best quarterback in the country. He ended up at the University of Alabama, where he became a star and led the Crimson Tide to a national championship. Entering the pros, Namath was again considered the best quarterback of his class. It's said that the NFL's New York Giants wanted him badly, but the AFL's New York Jets got him. Namath signed a contract in 1965 whose terms dwarfed anything previously seen in professional football, in any professional sport for that matter. For three years, Namath played his heart out, broke passing records, underwent knee surgeries, and led his team to losing seasons. But he never lost his belief in himself. He knew he could play and lead his team to victory. In the 1968 season, his fourth, he finally led his team to a winning season and a victory in the AFL Championship. He didn't care that nobody gave the Jets a chance to win against the NFL team. He believed in himself and his ability to win. He also convinced his team. What most people didn't know was that Namath had watched hours of film on the Colts as he did for every opponent. The one-eyed monster, it never lies, Namath used to say, referring to the projector he kept in his apartment. He showed his teammates what he saw. They could win that game. And that's exactly what they did. The Jets beat the Colts 16-7. to Most people consider it to be the biggest upset in Super Bowl history. What would have happened to Joe Namath if his father hadn't challenged him to believe in himself and his ability when he was only eight years old? Maybe he would have ended up like his brothers, talented athletes who dropped out of high school or college to work in the local mill or machine shop. Or maybe he would have ended up a pool hustler, It's hard to say, but one thing is certain. He wouldn't have ended up in the Pro Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. It takes more than talent to end up there. It also takes belief. I don't know what your talent is, but I do know this. It will not be lifted to its highest level unless you also have belief. Talent alone is never enough. If you want to become your best, you need to believe your best. You need to, first, believe in your potential. Your potential is a picture of what you can become. Inventor Thomas Edison remarked, If we did all the things we are capable of doing, we would literally astonish ourselves. Too often we see what is, not what could be. 
People looked at Joe Namath when he was young, and they saw a skinny, undersized kid. They looked at him when he was in high school, and they saw a kid who hung around with the wrong crowd and didn't do his homework. They looked at him when he was in the pros, and they saw a guy with bad knees. But he saw himself as a champion. If you could see yourself in terms of your true potential, you wouldn't recognize yourself. I believe the old saying, our potential is God's gift to us, our gift to Him is fulfilling it. Cartoonist Charles Schultz offered this comparison. Life is a 10-speed bike. Most of us have gears we never use. What are we saving those gears for? It's not good to travel through life without breaking a sweat. So what's the problem? Most of the time, it's self-imposed limitations. They limit us as much as real ones. Life is difficult enough as it is. We make it more difficult when we oppose additional limitations on ourselves. Industrialist Charles Schwab observed, When a man has put a limit on what he will do, he has put a limit on what he can do. In 2001, I was invited to Mobile, Alabama to speak to 600 NFL coaches and scouts at the Senior Bowl. That's the game played by two teams of college seniors who have been invited to participate because they are believed to have NFL potential. In the morning, I taught the 17 Indisputable Laws of Teamwork, which had just been published. And in the afternoon, I attended a workout session in which the players were tested for running speed, reaction time, jumping ability, and so forth. One of the coaches in attendance, Dick Vermeil, chatted with me as I watched. At some point, he said, You know, we can measure many of their skills, but it is impossible to measure the heart. Only the player can determine that. Your potential is really up to you. It doesn't matter what others might think. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't even matter what you might have believed about yourself at a previous time in your life. It's about what lies within you and whether you can bring it out. Not reaching your potential is a real tragedy. To reach your potential, you must first believe in your potential and determine to live way above average. Number two, believe in yourself. It's one thing to believe that you possess remarkable potential. It's another thing to have enough faith in yourself that you think you can fulfill it. When it comes to believing in themselves, some people are agnostic. That's not only a shame, it also keeps them from becoming what they could be. People who believe in themselves get better jobs and perform better in them than those who don't. Martin Seligman, professor of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, did some research at a major life insurance company and found that salespeople who expected to succeed sold 37% more insurance than those who didn't. The impact of belief in self begins early. Some researchers assert that when it comes to academic achievement in school, there is a greater correlation between self-confidence in achievement than there is between IQ and achievement. Attorney and marketing expert Carrie Randall observed, Successful people believe in themselves, especially when others do not. That's no more evident than in sports. Coaches have told me that self-confidence within players is especially important in tight ball games. During crunch time, some players want the ball. Others want to hide. The ones who want the ball are the self-confident ones, like Namath, who held the ball down to the last second during a high school basketball game in which his team was one point behind. While his team's leading scorer kept shouting, Give me the ball! Namath was as cool as ever and sank the winning shot as the buzzer sounded. Only with belief in yourself will you be able to reach your potential. Number three, believe in your mission. What else is necessary to lift a person's talent? Believing in what you are doing. In fact, even if the odds are against your accomplishing what you desire, confidence will help you. William James asserted, The one thing that will guarantee the successful conclusion of a doubtful undertaking is faith in the beginning that you can do it. How does this kind of belief help? Belief in your mission will empower you. Having confidence in what you are doing gives you the power to achieve it. Confident people can usually evaluate a task before undertaking it and know whether they can do it. In that belief is great power. Belief in your mission will encourage you. A woman with a will to win will have her naysayers. A man on a mission will have his critics. 
What often allows such people to keep going in a negative environment? Belief in the mission. Belief in your mission will enlarge you. The more you believe in your potential, yourself, and your mission, the more you will be able to accomplish. If you keep believing, you will someday find yourself doing what you once considered impossible. Actor Christopher Reeve had that perspective, and it carried him far. He once told an audience, On the wall of my room when I was in rehab was a picture of the space shuttle blasting off, autographed by every astronaut now at NASA. On top of the picture, it says, We found nothing is impossible. That should be our motto. It's something that we as a nation must do together. So many of our dreams at first seem impossible, then they seem improbable, and then when we summon the will, they soon become inevitable. If we can conquer outer space, we should be able to conquer inner space too. The frontier of the brain, the central nervous system, and the afflictions of the body that destroy so many lives and rob so much potential. Do you believe in your mission? Are you confident that you can accomplish great tasks? Do you expect to achieve your goals? These are necessary ingredients to lift your talent from potential to fruition. I need to say one more thing about mission. It needs to include people. Only a life lived for others is worthwhile. As you fulfill your mission, will others around you say, my life is better as a result or my life is worse as a result? If you think it won't be the former, then the mission may not be worth doing. Talent plus belief equal a talent plus person. So, how do you become a talent plus person? You tap into a natural chain of actions that begins with belief and ends with positive action. Belief determines expectations. If you want your talent to be lifted to its highest level, then you don't begin by focusing on your talent. You begin by harnessing the power of your mind. Your beliefs control everything you do. Accomplishment is more than a matter of working harder or smarter. It's also a matter of believing positively. Someone called it the sure enough syndrome. If you expect to fail, sure enough you will. If you expect to succeed, sure enough you will. You will become on the outside what you believe on the inside. Personal breakthroughs begin with a change in your beliefs. Why? Because your beliefs determine your expectations and your expectations determine your actions. A belief is a habit of mind in which confidence becomes a conviction that we embrace. In the long run, a belief is more than an idea that a person possesses. It's an idea that possesses a person. Benjamin Franklin said, Blessed is he who expects nothing, for he shall never be disappointed. If you want to achieve something in life, you have to be willing to be disappointed. You need to expect to succeed. Does that mean you always will? No, you will fail. You will make mistakes. But if you expect to win, you maximize your talent and you keep trying. Then, like Joe Namath, you will eventually succeed. Attorney Kerry Randall said, Contrary to popular opinion, life does not get better by chance. Life gets better by change. And this change always takes place inside. It's the change of thought that creates the better life. Improvement comes from change, but change requires confidence. For that reason... You need to make confidence in yourself a priority. You need to put believing in your potential, yourself, your mission, and your fellow human beings at the top of your list. Expectations determine actions. Fred Smith Sr., one of my mentors and author of Leading with Integrity, says that a linguist with Wycliffe Bible Translators told him that in 20 of the world's most primitive languages, the word for belief is the same as the word for do. It is only as people become more sophisticated that they begin to separate the meaning of one word from the other. That insight is very telling, because most people separate belief from action. So how can we bring those two things back together? Through our expectations. We cannot live in a way that is inconsistent with our expectations for ourselves. It just doesn't happen. I once heard a story that I have not been able to confirm about an aviation pioneer who built a plane the year before the Wright brothers made their historic flight in Kitty Hawk. The plane sat in the inventor's barn because he was afraid to fly it. 
Maybe it was because it never had been done before. Maybe it was because he expected to fail. I don't know. It is said that after the news reached him about Orville and Wilbur Wright, the man flew his plane. Before then, he didn't believe in himself enough to take the risk. There are two kinds of people in this world, those who want to get things done and those who don't want to make mistakes. The Wright brothers were of the first type. The would-be aviation pioneer was of the second. If you're the first type, then you already expect to believe in yourself and take risk. But what if you're afraid like the second type? There's good news. You can grow. A story in Robert Schuller's book, Tough Times Never Last, But Tough People Do, is about Sir Edmund Hillary, who was the first person to reach the summit of Mount Everest along with Tibetan Tenzing Norgay. Prior to his success on Everest, Hillary had been part of another expedition in which the team not only had failed to reach the summit, but had also lost one of its members. At a reception for the expedition members in London, Hillary stood to address the audience. Behind the platform was a huge photograph of Everest. Hillary turned to face the image of the mountain and exclaimed, Mount Everest, you have defeated us, but I will return, and I will defeat you, because you cannot get any bigger, and I can. I don't know what challenges you face. They may be getting bigger every day, or they may already be as big as they can get, like Mount Everest. But I do know this. The only way you can rise to meet the challenges effectively is to expect to. You don't overcome challenges by making them smaller. You overcome them by making yourself bigger. Actions determine results. Results come from actions. That may seem obvious in the physical realm. Sir Isaac Newton's third law of motion states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. However, in the human realm, many people don't make the connection. They simply hope for good results. Hope is not a strategy. If you want good results, you need to perform good actions. If you want to perform good actions, you need to have positive expectations. To have positive expectations, you have to first believe. It all goes back to that. A popular activity for tourists in Switzerland is mountain climbing, not the type of climbing that the world-class mountaineers do to scale the world's highest peaks. Maybe it would be more accurate to call it high-altitude hiking. Groups depart from a base camp early in the morning with the intention of making it to the top of the mountain by mid-afternoon. I talked to a guide about his experience with these groups, and he described an interesting phenomenon. He said that for most of these expeditions, the people stop at the halfway house where the climbers have lunch, catch their breath, and prepare themselves for the last leg of a rigorous climb. Invariably, some members of the group opt for the warmth and the comfort of the halfway house and decide not to climb to the top. As the rest of the group leaves, the ones who stay are happy and talkative. It's a party. But when the shadows begin to lengthen, many make their way over to the window and look up the mountain. And the room gets quiet as they wait for the climbers to return. Why is that? They realize they missed a special opportunity. Most of them will never be in that part of the world again. They won't ever have a chance to climb that mountain again. They missed it. That's what it's like when people don't make the most of their talent. When they don't believe in themselves and their potential, when they don't act on their belief and try to make the most of every opportunity. Don't allow that to happen to you. Live the life you were meant to. Try to see yourself as you could be, and then do everything in your power to believe that you can become that person. That is the first important step in becoming a Talent Plus person. Chapter 2. Passion Energizes Your Talent What carries people to the top? What makes them take risks? go the extra mile, and do whatever it takes to achieve their goals. It isn't talent. It's passion. Passion is more important than a plan. Passion creates fire. It provides fuel. I have yet to meet a passionate person who lacked energy. As long as the passion is there, it doesn't matter if they fail. It doesn't matter how many times they fall down. It doesn't matter if others are against them or if people say they cannot succeed. They keep going and make the most of whatever talent they possess. They are talent plus people, and they do not stop until they succeed. 
What does a boy like Ruben Martinez do in a place like Miami, Arizona? Miami is a small mining town of 2,000 people in the southeastern part of Arizona that had changed little since its founding in 1907. When Reuben was growing up in the 1940s and 50s, most of the town's jobs came from the copper mining industry as they still do. Reuben's parents, who were Mexican immigrants, worked in the mines. There wasn't much to do in Miami, but Reuben had a curious mind and he found his passion in books. Not necessarily an easy task when your parents aren't big readers and your town is so small that it doesn't even have a public library. My mother always wanted me to put down my books and clean the yard, recalls Reuben, so I would hide in the outhouse and read because no one would bother me there. The child was so desperate for reading material that he became very industrious. Every morning at 6.45, he said, the newspaper boy would deliver the newspaper, and when it hit my neighbor's side of the house, I would wake up, go out to the back door, lean against my neighbor's house, and read the newspaper every morning thoroughly. Then I'd fold that newspaper and put it back as neatly as I could. Eventually, Reuben got caught, but his neighbor didn't mind and encouraged him to keep reading. Reuben was also inspired and assisted by two of his teachers. They continually encouraged his love of reading and loaned him books. When he was 17, Reuben moved to Los Angeles to find greater opportunities. The moment he saw the Pacific Ocean, he knew he'd never live in Arizona again. He took whatever jobs he could, he worked as a grocery clerk, crane operator, and factory worker, including at the Bethlehem Steel Mill in Maywood. But then one day he saw an ad for a barber college, and he was captivated by the idea of attending. I saw those smocks they wore, so white, he said. It was the opposite of the dirt of the mining world I wanted clean. In the 1970s, Ruben Martinez opened his own barber shop and became his own boss. He was making a better life for himself, but he never lost his passion for reading, a passion he wanted to pass on to others, especially young people in the Hispanic and Latino communities. According to a National Endowment for the Art Survey, the reading level among Hispanics is half that of non-Hispanic whites. Martinez wanted to change that. He started out by lending volumes from his 200-book collection to people waiting for a haircut. The books range from Spanish-language masterpieces like 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez and Don Quixote by Cervantes to American books by Hemingway or Silverstein translated into Spanish to a signed autobiography by actor Anthony Quinn. But often his patrons forgot to return the books, which frustrated Martinez and diminished his supply for other patrons. His solution? Start selling books. In 1993, Martinez offered books for sale for the first time. He started out with two titles, but it didn't take long for sales to increase, and he started carrying more titles. He became an advocate for literacy. He talked to parents about reading to the children. He talked to young people about diving into books. A few years later, the barbershop with books became a bookstore with a symbolic barber chair. Martinez called his store... Libraria Martinez Books and Art Gallery. We've started out with two books, says Martinez, then 10, then 25. Little by little, we've sold over 2 million books. That's what happens if you dare to dream. The store now stocks 17,000 titles and has become one of the country's largest collections of Spanish language books. Martinez opened a second store in 2001 and also a third store just for children. He tells parents, do you want your child to be ahead of the line or at the back of the line? You have to support, endorse, and read to your kid. If you do that, your kid will be at the head of the line and be someone special in the world. Reading does it. Martinez isn't stopping. In his mid-sixties, he has no intention of resting on his laurels. He is energized by what he does. I made more money cutting hair than selling books, notes Martinez, age 64, but the joy of my life is what I'm doing now. Martinez wants to create a bilingual, border-style chain of bookstores across the nation, hoping to establish 25 stores by 2012. If I stayed with my factory jobs, observes Martinez, I would have been living a comfortable retirement now. But I chose to go on my own as a barber. Now with the bookstores, I'm going to work for the rest of my life. My kids think I'm crazy. No, he's not crazy. 
He's just filled with passion. Passion can energize every aspect of a person's life, including his talent. Have you ever known a person with great passion who lacked the energy to act on what mattered to her? I doubt it. A passionate person with limited talent will outperform a passive person who possesses greater talent. Why? Because passionate people act with boundless enthusiasm, and they just keep on going. Talent plus passion energizes. Authors Robert J. Kriegel and Louis Patler cite a study of 1,500 people over 20 years that shows how passion makes a significant difference in a person's career. At the outset of the study, the group was divided into Group A, 83% of the sample, who were embarking on a career chosen for the prospects of making money now in order to do what they wanted later, and Group B, the other 17% of the sample, who had chosen their career path for the reverse reason. They were going to pursue what they wanted to do now and worry about the money later. The data showed some startling revelations. At the end of the 20 years, 101 of the 1,500 had become millionaires. Of the millionaires, all but one, 100 out of 101, were from Group B, the group that had chosen to pursue what they had loved. The old saying is true. Find something you like to do so much that you'd gladly do it for nothing, and if you learn to do it well, someday people will be happy to pay you for it. There really is no substitute for passion when it comes to energizing your talent. Take a look at what passion can do for you. Number one, passion is the first step to achievement. Loving what you do is the key that opens the door for achievement. When you don't like what you're doing, it really shows, no matter how hard you try to pretend it doesn't. It's difficult to achieve when you don't have the desire to do so. That's why passion is so important. There's a story about Socrates in which a proud and disdainful young man came to the philosopher and with a smirk said, Oh, great Socrates, I come to you for knowledge. Seeing the shallow and vain man for what he was, he led the young man down to the sea into waist-deep water. Then he said, Tell me again, what do you want? Knowledge, he responded with a smile. Socrates grabbed the young man by his shoulders and pushed him down into the water, holding him there for thirty seconds. Now, what do you want? Wisdom, O oh great Socrates, the young man sputtered. The philosopher pushed him under once again. When he let him up, he asked again, What do you want? Knowledge, O oh wise, and he managed to spit out before Socrates held him under again, this time even longer. What do you want? the old man asked as he let him up again. The younger man coughed and gasped. Uh, he screamed, uh, I need air. When you want knowledge as much as you wanted air, then you will get knowledge, the old man stated as he returned to the shore. The only way that you can achieve anything of significance is to really want it. Passion does that. Number two, passion increases willpower. One of my roles as a motivational teacher is to try to help people reach their potential. For years, I tried to inspire passion in audiences by going about it the wrong way. I used to tell people about what made me passionate, what made me want to get out there and do my best. But I could see that it wasn't having the effect I desired. People just didn't respond. I couldn't ignite others' passion by sharing my own. I decided to change my focus. Instead of sharing my passion, I started helping others discover their passion. To do that, I ask these questions. What do you sing about? What do you cry about? What do you dream about? The first two questions speak to what touches you at a deep level today. The third answer is what will bring you fulfillment tomorrow. The answers to these questions can often help people discover their true passion. While everybody can possess passion, not everyone takes the time to discover it. And that's a shame. Passion is fuel for the will. Passion turns your have-tos into want-tos. What we accomplish in life is based less on what we want and more on how much we want it. The secret to willpower is what someone once called want power. People who want something enough usually find the willpower to achieve it. You can't help people become winners unless they want to win. Champions become champions from within, 
not from without. Number three, passion produces energy. When you have passion, you become energized. You don't have to produce perseverance. It is naturally present in you. It helps you to enjoy the journey as much as reaching the destination. Without it, achievement becomes a long haul and difficult road. For many years, my wife Margaret has called me the Energizer Bunny because of the commercials where the battery-operated rabbit keeps going and going. I guess she does so with good reason. I do have a lot of energy. There are always things I hope to do, people I want to see, and goals I want to reach. The reason is passion. We often call people high energy or low energy based on how much they do. But I have come to the conclusion that it might be more appropriate to call them high or low passion. During a Q&A session at a conference, an attendee once asked me, what is the secret of your passion? It took me only a moment to be able to articulate it. First, I am gifted at what I do. I'm in my strength zone. Secondly, what I do makes a difference. In other words, I see results. And thirdly, when I do what I am made to do, I feel most alive. It gives me purpose. I believe all passionate people feel that way. Aviation pioneer Charles Lindbergh observed, It's the greatest shot of adrenaline to be doing what you've wanted to do so badly. You almost feel like you could fly without the plane. Be like Ruben Martinez, who is still going strong beyond age 60. People often describe him as acting half his age. What gives him such energy? His passion. Fourth, passion is the foundation for excellence. Passion can transform someone from average to excellent. I can tell you that from experience. When I was in high school, I wasn't a great student. My priorities were basketball first, friends second, and studies a distant third. Why? Because playing basketball and spending time with friends were things I was passionate about. I studied, but only to please my parents. School held little appeal for me. Everything changed when I went to college. For the first time, I was studying subjects that mattered to me. They were interesting, and they would apply to my future career. My grades went up because my passion did. In high school, I was sometimes on the principal's list, which was not a good thing, but in college, I continually made the dean's list. Passion fired my desire to achieve with excellence. Talent plus passion equal a talent plus person. If you don't possess the energy that you desire, then you need to fire up your passion. Here's how I suggest you proceed. Number one, prioritize your life according to your passion. In the 1970s, I realized that my talent would be maximized and my potential realized only if I matched my passion with my priorities. I was spending too much time doing tasks for which I possessed neither talent nor passion. I had to make a change to align what I felt strongly about with what I was doing. It made a huge difference in my life. It didn't eliminate my troubles or remove my obstacles, but it empowered me to face them with greater energy and enthusiasm. For more than 30 years, I have worked to maintain that alignment of priorities and passion. And as I have, I've kept in my mind this quote by journalist Tim Redman, which I put in a prominent place for a year to keep me on track. There are many things that will catch my eye, but there are only a few things that will catch my heart. It is those I consider to pursue. If your priorities are not aligned with your passion, then begin thinking about making changes in your life. Will change be risky? Probably. But which would you rather live with, the pain of risk or the pain of regret? Number two, protect your passion. If you've ever built a fire, then you know this. The natural tendency of fire is to go out. If you want to keep fire hot, then you need to feed it and you need to protect it. Not everyone in your life will help you do that when it comes to your passion. In truth, there are two kinds of people. Fire lighters, who will go out of their way to help you keep your fire hot, and fire fighters, who will throw cold water on the fire of passion that burns within you. How can you tell the fire lighters from the fire fighters? Listen to what they say. Firefighters use phrases like, It's not in the budget. It's not practical. We tried that before and it didn't work. We've never done that before. The boss won't go for it. 
If it ain't broke, then don't fix it. That's not the way we do things around here. It'll never work. If you've heard one or more of these phrases coming from people you know, you may want to create some distance between yourself and them. Those firefighters focus on what's wrong rather than what's right. They find the cloud that comes from every silver lining. They doubt. They resist change. They keep people from reaching their potential by trying to put out the fire of their passion. Stay away from them. Instead, spend more time with people who see you not just as you are, but as you could be. People who encourage your dreams, ignite your passion. I try to schedule lunch or two with firelighters like that every month. They really fire me up and energize me to do what I know is best for me. Number three, pursue your passion with everything you've got. Your passion has the potential to provide you energy far beyond the limitations of your talent. In the end, you will be remembered for your passion. It is what will energize your talent. It is what will empower you to make your mark. Chapter 3. Initiative Activates Your Talent It's a cliché to say that every journey begins with a first step, yet it is still true. Talent plus people don't wait for everything to be perfect to move forward. They don't wait for all the problems or obstacles to disappear. They don't wait until their fear subsides. They take initiative. They know a secret that good leaders understand. Momentum is their friend. As soon as they take their first step and start moving forward, things become a little easier. If the momentum gets strong enough, many of the problems take care of themselves and talent can take over. But it starts only after you have taken those first steps. On January 17, 1994, at 4.30 in the morning, a 6.7 magnitude earthquake struck the Los Angeles area. The earthquake was considered moderate in contrast to the San Francisco earthquake of 1906, was believed to be more than 10 times as powerful, but it still did an incredible amount of damage. More than 50 people died and 9,000 were seriously injured. More than 22,000 people were left homeless, and 7,000 buildings were judged uninhabitable with an additional 22,000 sustaining major damage. The quake closed nine hospitals, ruined several freeways, and collapsed nine bridges. The disaster termed the North Ridge Earthquake was centered beneath the San Fernando Valley and did $44 billion in damage. Some experts considered the people who lived in the area to be fortunate because the earthquake occurred so early in the morning and on a holiday, Martin Luther King Day. Yet it was still the most monetarily costly earthquake in the history of the United States. Los Angeles typically has the worst congestion and traffic delays of any large city in the nation. The effects of the North Ridge earthquake made them worse. One of the most problematic areas was a section of Interstate 10 called the Santa Monica Freeway in the heart of Los Angeles, the most heavily used highway in the world. Every day it carries as many as 341,000 vehicles. Estimates were that it would cost California $1 million a day and lost wages, added fuel cost, and depressed business activity for every day it was closed. Environmental reviews and permitting requirements in California routinely take 18 to 24 months, and construction on a project this size usually takes well over six months. At a cost of $1 million a day, that would mean the closure of the Santa Monica Freeway alone would create a negative impact costing Los Angeles more than $900 million. Governor Pete Wilson knew that he needed to act to solve the problem. He initiated a plan to clear the way for quick reconstruction. Wilson recounts, I issued an executive order suspending all statutes and regulations related to state contracting. My goal was to reopen I-10 within six months. Each contract included an incentive. If the work was late, we charged a fine, and if it was completed early, we paid a bonus. Demolition and removal work had begun a mere six hours after the earthquake. And on Monday, January the 31st, just two weeks after the earthquake, Caltrans, the state's agency responsible for freeway construction, invited five contractors to bid on the job of rebuilding the Santa Monica Freeway. Preliminary plans were made available to the contractors that night. 
but bids would be due Friday, February 4th at 10 a.m., just four days later. The contract would be awarded that night, and construction would commence on Saturday, February the 5th. And there were two other important pieces of information. First, the maximum amount of time allowed for construction was 140 days. Second, the financial stakes for finishing the project on time were high. If the winning contractor finished the project late, there would be a penalty of $200,000 per day. However, the contractor would receive $200,000 per day over the bid for each day it finished ahead of schedule. One company that received the offer to bid was C.C. Myers, which had completed several Caltrans projects in the past. The company bid the project at $14.7 million, with a promise to finish in 140 days. However, the management team privately set the goal of completing it in 100 days. If all went well, the company would make an additional $8 million. But of course, everything didn't go well. C.C. Myers planned to work its crews in 12-hour shifts, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. The crews quickly became fatigued. The solution? The managers hired more workers. A job that size usually requires 65 carpenters. They hired 228. Instead of 15 iron workers, they employed 134. They continually initiated steps to speed up the project, such as using an expensive, fast-drying concrete rather than their usual material. And when the company was informed that the railroads would require three weeks to deliver the steel beams needed for the project, C.C. Myers chartered its own trains to get the supplies from Arkansas and Texas to Los Angeles. C.C. Myers' initiative paid off. The company just didn't beat the 140-day deadline or even its own internal goal of 100 days. The crews finished the job in a mere 66 days, 74 days ahead of schedule. And in the process, the organization earned bonuses totaling $14.5 million, nearly the amount of the original bid. The C.C. Myers organization had expertise, experience, and a proven track record. But the leaders didn't rely on those things alone. Why? They knew that talent alone is never enough. They knew they needed Talent Plus. To complete the Santa Monica Freeway project, they needed to show initiative in the bidding process, in the leadership of their people, and in the management of the details. That initiative brought them great success. And the company continues to show initiative. In the wake of the North Ridge earthquake, Myers began working with engineers at the University of Southern California on innovations to strengthen existing freeways against earthquake damage. If you want to reach your potential, you have to show initiative, just as Governor Pete Wilson and the leaders of the C.C. Myers did. Here's why. Number one, initiative is the first step to anywhere you want to go. A tourist paused for a rest in a small town in the mountains. He sat down on a bench next to an old man in front of the town's only store. Hi, friend, he said. Can you tell me something the town is noted for? Well, answered the old man after a moment's hesitation, you can start here and get to anywhere in the world you want. That's true of nearly every location. Where you finish in life isn't determined so much by where you start as by whether you start. If you're willing to get started and keep initiating, there's no telling how far you might go. That was the case of Les Brown. Les and his brother Wes were adopted when they were six weeks old, and they grew up in Liberty City, a poor section of Miami, Florida. As a child, Les was branded as a slow learner and given very little chance of success by many of his teachers. But with the encouragement of one of his high school teachers who told him, someone else's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. Les managed to graduate from high school and later got a job as a radio DJ. With much hard work, he became a broadcast manager. He got involved in his community, became a community activist and leader, and eventually was elected to the state legislature for three terms. And then he turned his attention to public speaking, where he received the National Speakers Association's highest honor and was named one of the world's top five speakers, according to Toastmasters, in 1992. He has written books, hosts his own syndicated television show, owns a business, and commands 25000 per appearance as a public speaker. 
When he started life, most people wouldn't have given him much of a chance to succeed. Few thought he had talent, but he just kept moving forward, and he has since moved far beyond his detractors. Successful people initiate, and then they follow through. Number two, initiative closes the door to fear. Author Catherine Patterson said, To fear is one thing, to let fear grab you by the tail and swing you around is another. We all have fears. The question is whether we are going to control them or allow them to control us. In 1995, my friend Dan Ryland and his wife Patty went skydiving along with a group of friends, including my writer Charlie Wetzel. They approached the event with a mixture of excitement and fear. At the Skydiving Center in Southern California, they received only a few minutes of training to prepare them for their tandem jumps. Dan said they were feeling pretty good about the whole thing until a guy walked in the room and made a pitch to sell them life insurance. As the plane ascended to 11,000 feet, they became increasingly nervous. Then they opened the sliding door at the back of the plane, at which point the fear factor went through the roof. Wishing they had worn rubber pants, they approached the door, each of them harnessed to a jump master, and then launched themselves out of the plane. Within seconds, they were hurtling toward the earth at 120 miles an hour. And after a free fall of 6,000 feet, they pulled their ripcords. When the canopy opened with a forceful jolt, they went from 120 miles an hour to 25 miles an hour. Dan said, it made my underwear find places it had never found before. I laugh whenever Dan tells the story, but I was really surprised to learn from Dan and Patty that as petrified as they were before they jumped, All their fear was gone the second they left the plane. Author and pastor Norman Vincent Peale asserted, Action is a great restorer and builder of confidence. Inaction is not only the result, but the cause of fear. Perhaps the action you take will be successful. Perhaps different action or adjustments will have to follow. But any action is better than no action at all. If you want to close the door on fear, get moving. Number three, initiative opens the door to opportunity. Benjamin Franklin, one of our nation's founding fathers, advised, To succeed, jump as quickly at opportunities as you do at conclusions. People who take initiative and work hard may succeed or they may fail, but anyone who doesn't take initiative is almost guaranteed to fail. I'm willing to bet that you have a decision you should be making, a problem you should be solving, a possibility you should be examining, a project you should be starting, a goal you should be reaching, an opportunity you should be seizing, a dream you should be fulfilling. No one can wait until everything is perfect to act and expect to be successful. It's better to be 80% sure and make things happen than it is to wait until you are 100% sure because by then the opportunity will have already passed you. Number four. Initiative eases life's difficulties. Psychiatrist M. Scott Peck famously stated, Life is difficult. That's not most people's problem. Their response to life difficulties is, Too many people wait around for their ship to come in. When they take that approach to life, they often find it to be a hardship. The things that simply come to us are rarely the things we want. To have a chance at getting what we desire, we need to work for it. The longer we let things slide, the harder they become. The hardest work is often the accumulation of many easy things that should have been done yesterday, last week, or last month. The only way to get rid of a difficult task is to do it. That takes initiative. Talent plus initiative equal a talent plus person. To be honest, all of us are plagued by procrastination in some area of our lives. If something is unpleasant, uninteresting, or complex, we tend to put it off. Even some things we like doing can cause us difficulty. Yet to reach our potential and become talent plus people, we must show initiative. Here are some suggestions to help you as you strive to become a talent plus person in this area. Number one, accept responsibility for your life. Greek philosopher Socrates said, To move the world, we must first move ourselves. Show me those who neglect to take responsibility for their own lives, and I'll show you people who also lack initiative. Responsibility and initiative are inseparable. We cannot wish our way to success, 
we need to take responsibility and act. Number two, examine your reasons for not initiating. If you lack initiative, the only way you will be able to change is to first identify the specific problems. Are you in denial about the consequences of not taking initiative and responsibility for yourself? Are you waiting for others to motivate you instead of working to motivate yourself? Are you waiting for everything to be perfect before you act? Are you fantasizing about tomorrow instead of focusing on what you can do today? Or is there some other issue that is preventing you from taking action? What's important is that you separate legitimate reasons from excuses. An excuse puts the blame on someone or something outside of you. Excuses are like exit signs on the road of progress. They take us off track. Know this, it's easier to move from failure to success than from excuses to success. Eliminate excuses. Once you've done that, you can turn your attention to the reasons and how to overcome them. Number three, focus on the benefits of completing a task. It is extremely difficult to be successful if you are forever putting things off. Procrastination is the fertilizer that makes difficulties grow. When you take too long to make up your mind about an opportunity that presents itself, you will miss out on seizing it. In the previous chapter, I discussed the importance of aligning your priorities with your passion. To become effective and make progress in your area of talent or responsibility, you can't spend your valuable time on unimportant or unnecessary tasks. So I'm going to make an assumption that if you do procrastinate about a task, it is a necessary one. If it is not, don't put it off. Eliminate it. To get yourself over the hump, focus on what you'll get out of it if you get it done. Will completing the task bring a financial benefit? Will it clear away for something else you would like to do? Does it represent a milestone in your development or the completion of something bigger? At the very least, does it help to clear the decks for you emotionally? If you seek a positive reason, you are likely to find one. Once you find that idea, start moving forward and act decisively. Number four, share your goal with a friend who will help you. No one achieves success alone. Lindbergh didn't fly solo across the Atlantic without help. Einstein didn't develop the theory of relativity in a vacuum, and Columbus didn't discover the new world on his own. They all had help. There is no way to put a value on the assistance that others can give you in achieving your dreams. Share your goals and dreams with people who care about you and who would encourage and assist you in accomplishing them. It means taking a risk because you will have to be vulnerable in sharing your hopes and ambitions, but the risk is worth taking. Number five, break large tasks down into smaller ones. Once you remove some of the internal barriers that may be stopping you from taking initiative, and you enlist the help of others, you're ready to get practical. Many times, large tasks overwhelm people, and that's a problem because overwhelmed people seldom initiate. Here's how I suggest you proceed in breaking an intimidating goal into more manageable parts. Divide it by categories. Most large objectives are complex and can be broken into steps for functions. The smaller pieces often require the effort of people with particular talents, Begin by figuring out what skill sets will be required to accomplish the smaller task. Prioritize it by importance. When we don't take initiative and prioritize what we must do according to its importance, the tasks begin to arrange themselves according to their urgency. When the urgent starts driving you instead of the important, you lose any kind of initiative edge, and instead of activating your talent, it robs you of the best opportunities to use it. Order it by sequence. Dividing the task according to its categories helps you to understand how you will need to accomplish it. Prioritizing by importance helps you to understand why you need to do each part of it. Ordering by sequence helps you to know when each part needs to be done. The important thing here is to create a timetable. Give yourself deadlines and stick to them. The biggest lie we tell ourselves when it comes to action is, I'll do it later. Assign it by abilities. When you divide the large task into smaller ones by category, you begin to understand what kinds of people you'll need to get the job done. 
At this stage, you very specifically answer the why question. As a leader, I can tell you that the most important step in accomplishing something big is determining who will be on the team. Assign tasks to winners and give them authority and responsibility, and the job will get done. Fail to give a specific person ownership of the task or give it to an average person, and you may find yourself in trouble. Accomplish it by teamwork. Even if you break a task down, strategically plan, and recruit great people, you still need one more element to succeed. Everyone has to be able to work together. Teamwork is the glue that can bring it all together. Number six, allocate specific times to tasks you might procrastinate. Dawson Trotman, the author and the founder of The Navigators, observed, The greatest time wasted is the time getting started. Haven't you found that to be true? The hardest part of writing a letter is pinning the first line. The hardest part of making a tough phone call is picking up the receiver and dialing the number. The most difficult part of practicing the piano is sitting down at the keyboard. It's the start that often stops people. So how do you overcome that difficulty? Try scheduling a specific time for something you don't like doing. For example, if dealing with difficult people is a regular part of your job, but you tend to avoid doing it, then schedule a set time for it. Maybe the best time would be between 2 and 3 o'clock every day. Treat it like an appointment, and when 3 o'clock rolls around, stop until tomorrow. Number 7. Remember, preparation includes doing. One of the questions I often hear concerns writing. Young leaders frequently ask me how I got started, and I tell them about my first book, Think on These Things. It's a small book comprised of many three-page chapters, but it took me nearly a year to write it. I remember many nights when I spent hours scribbling on a legal pad, only to have a few sentences to show from my effort. I want to sell a lot of books and influence a lot of people like you do, these young leaders will declare. That's great, I'll answer. What have you written? Well, n nothing yet, is typically the response. Okay, I say. What are you working on? I ask the question, hoping to give them some encouragement. Well, I'm not actually writing yet, but I have a lot of ideas, they'll say, explaining that they hope they'll have more time next month or next year or after they get out of school. When I hear an answer like that, I know that it will never happen. Writers write. Composers compose. Leaders lead. You must take action in order to become who you desire to be. Desire isn't enough. Good intentions aren't enough. Talent isn't enough. Success requires initiative. To continue listening to Talent is Never Enough by John C. Maxwell, please insert the next CD.